Michael Strevens is professor at uh, New York University. He's Guggenheim Fellow, and his specialism is the philosophy of science. He's also the author of a new book entitled The Knowledge Machine, How an Unreasonable Idea Created Modern Science, which we'll look at today. Michael, welcome. Thanks very much. Great to be here. Thank you. T tell me, before we begin with the book, and I wanted to, to, to examine the book in some detail and go through it section by section, but mm. what is it that made you take up philosophy in the first place? How did, how did it bring you here to, to being a professor in, in New York? I believe you come from New Zealand uh, originally. That's right, yeah. So um, I started out really um, very interested in uh, the sciences and everything connected to the sciences. Um, uh, as a university student, I was studying mathematics, computer science, physics, uh, and that was all wonderful. Uh, one thing I realized, which is a little bit connected to the themes of the book, is that I didn't really have the patience to become a scientist. Uh, I was more interested or more drawn or uh, just more, <laughs> more personally able to, to step back and take the, the, um, the God's eye view of things, which we as philosophers like to do, uh, pose the big questions, sketch the big answers and let other people do the difficult, the arduous work of um, figuring out exactly how all the pieces fit together. So I became a philosopher. Well, and no regrets at all on that. <laughs> No, no, I'm very much enjoying myself. If I ever feel like uh, dipping down into the details, then I'm uh, always able to do that. But it's not a part of my job description to turn up every day of the week and make sure that a lab is running to specification. I can see it has its advantages. Um, Michael, your, your book, The Knowledge Machine, has got some good reviews on the back here. The Knowledge Machine is the best introduction to the scientific enterprise that I know. A very important book, said David Wotton. A powerful, bracingly argued and important book. Uh, beautifully lucid and accessible. A rare achievement. Entertaining and edifying all at once. And also uh, a delight to read, richly illustrated with wonderfully told incidents from the history of natural science. So tell me, Michael, how did the book come about and why did it need to be written? Well, I this is a book that that is, is really the, uh, contains um, some, some ideas of mine about the way science works that I haven't um, put into words in any other place. So uh, this isn't just a, a kind of a popular retelling of uh, some of my philosophical research that I've published in more philosophical venues. There's a little bit of that. But I wrote the book because I thought it was the best way to put these ideas into print uh, for everybody, including my philosophical colleagues. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is that uh, these ideas, and really the ideas of anyone who's thinking about uh, the way science hangs together and functions, are inherently uh, quite uh, multidisciplinary. So we need uh, a kind of a philosophical mindset, that, that view from 30,000 feet. Um, but to really think productively about science, I think you have to be a kind of a sociological thinker and a historical thinker uh, all at once. So the topic calls for a, a kind of a, a broad-based approach that I thought uh, in some ways suited the, the, um, the, the, the style of a general audience book better than uh, the style of an academic tome, which has to um, uh, uh, contain all of the, the references, the scholarly paraphernalia and so on that is relevant to, to every point it makes paragraph by paragraph. Uh, and that all in the end would have just been too much. So if you like, it's a kind of a, an attempt to go back to the, the old days when, well, someone like, for example, this is a, a too flattering of a comparison, but someone like Darwin, say, would put his ideas about the theory of evolution into a book that was, uh, in the first place, intended um, just for the general reader, uh, uh, as well as, of course, for all his scientific colleagues. Um, that's, why, that's why I wrote it the way I did. And the, the reason I, I wanted to um, express these particular ideas is simply because uh, 
the question of how science works is such an important and interesting one, one I've been working on my whole life. This, in a way, is the culmination of, of the thinking I've been doing over the last 20 or, or 25 years. So with the title, The Knowledge Machine, and how an unreasonable idea created modern science, what is the unreasonable idea that you're referring to then? So a part of the setup for the book is the, the notion that, which, which his, the history of, of inquiry into the way the world works really strongly suggests, the notion that something happened about three, 400 years ago in the period that is justly known as the scientific revolution, that really changed the, the, the way that people were, um, were thinking about how to, how to go about figuring out how the world works. Uh, and uh, part of what I wanted to do in this book is, is, is to figure out for myself what this, this new idea was, and it's the unreasonable idea. Uh, what's unreasonable, although incredibly fruitful about it, uh, certainly something that we should, we should um, salute rather than bemoaning, is, is a kind of a extreme narrowness in, uh, in assessing answers to and regulating, if you like, policing the answers that we give to questions about the world, the kinds of questions that physicists and biologists and sociologists pose. Uh, and the narrowness is something that we're now so used to that I think it doesn't sound, so, it sound this sounds like simply what science does. It is what science does. Uh, what I wanted to do by calling it unreasonable or even in, in the American title, irrational, is to make people sit up and take notice and, and see perhaps for the first time how strange science is, how much it goes against the grain uh, of the way that we as human beings are naturally inclined to think about things. Okay. You, you split the book up into four main sections. So we've got section one is the, the great method debate and section two is how science works. And then you've got why science took so long and then bringing us up to date science now. If we, if we can try and walk through that and see how that, that um, stacks and what the argument is. So tell us about the first section and what the idea behind that was, the great method debate. Well, as long as, as modern science has existed, I guess really for as long as any kind of inquiry into nature has existed, you have people trying to figure out how it ought to be done. Aristotle, for example, is writing uh, uh, thousands of years ago about how it ought to be done. Um, but much more recently, uh, really only in the last hundred years ago has there been an intense scrutiny of this question uh, by uh, philosophers um, who are able to look at modern science and, and, and ask, ponder that question I, I just posed of what it was that scientists have been doing recently, uh, differently for the last few hundred years that has made science into such a powerful knowledge producing machine. So this has given rise to a great argument uh, as I guess uh, that's something you always get when a bunch of philosophers start to <laughs> ask a question about what the scientific method really is. Uh, now, at least, at least in, in high schools here in the US, there is a kind of a, a dogma about that. You go in and you take your science classes and you get you taught something which is supposed to be an explanation of what the scientific method is. Meanwhile, if you turn around and, and, and after that and go off, uh, say, into the university system and talk to sociologists or historians or philosophers, the message you're liable to hear is that there is really no scientific method. It's all rather confusing, really. Uh, but various people have, uh, have, have um, proposed big ideas about what it is that science does differently, whether it's a, a method or just a kind of a, a personality trait of scientists, whether it's a, a piece of logic or a kind of a social institution. All of these are different kinds of ideas. And the, the great method debate is my name for that conversation occasionally vociferous argument that's been going on for the last hundred years. An argument where uh, one very, uh, perhaps <laughs> the dominant side right now is saying, there simply is no method. Hmm. So, I mean, you mentioned two, two big names in, in, the, in that section. One, one is Karl Popper, of course, and his famous book, The Logic de Forschung, the, um, the Logic of Scientific 
discovery. And, and um, Thomas Kuhn, the um, structure of scientific revolutions. Um, is there, is, you're saying that the debate is no longer just between those two. The debate has moved on from that to something else. That's right. So uh, in that same section, after we, we meet Popper and Kuhn, who have really quite opposing views of what it is that science does uh, that is so special, uh, we get into the views of um, many modern sociologists of science, uh, but as, which are, as I say, shared by historians and philosophers, that there is nothing you can really find when you look closely at science that is a method. So with Popper and Kuhn, you have what is essentially more a kind of a philosophizing, uh, uh, a somewhat idealized philosophizing about science that that makes these great claims about what it is that scientists do. When you when you take a more scientific approach, an empirical approach, you find that uh, none of those stories actually turns out to be true. And that's where we get the there is no method um, school of thought about the method. And and I mean. Uh, to uh, the closest I, I came to to understanding a particular method was was Popper's view of the the idea that it, you're not you're not in science to to prove anything, but you're in science to disprove things and and cast theories to the wayside, and and only the ones which are strongest will survive, and then you replace those as they get weak too. I have to say that when I read your account of Popper's um, statements, uh, it's the best account I've read of the, the, the clear way in which, which putting them. I mean, I've been reading Popper for a long time, but I, and even your, your way in which you, you expressed it struck me as being fresh and, and a very clear way of expressing his views. Um, but you would say that Popper doesn't hold sway anymore then? It would be probably more, there, there's two, there's really two aspects to Popper. One is the idea that a theory that faces enough countervailing evidence is going to be struck down. Uh, uh, and the other is this idea that scientists to, to do science right have to bring to it an ex a critical attitude, a, a desire to use the logic of falsification, as he puts it, to, to refute theories. Both of those ideas have, have run into trouble. Um, in the sense that uh, the, the idea that uh, theory that faces a lot of a lot of um, contrary evidence will eventually subside is has got to be right at some broad level of description. What, but Popper's idea is a little too simple. What, what kind of trouble is it run into then? Could, could you expand on that a bit to say why why people might disregard that view, the, the falsification idea? So Popper, at least when he's when he's talking it in his, in his most general way, is uh, talks as though uh, a single a single observation that that a theory gets wrong uh, can destroy the theory. Hmm. Now even he knows himself that it's not that simple. The reason is the single observation could be a result of a faulty instrument. You know, your telescope isn't working. Um, uh, or uh, you did your sums wrong, your calculation is just incorrect. So you've got to go back and check it. Um, when we actually look at the history of science, what we find is a lot of really quite passionate argument about these things. Of course, a simple mathematical mistake can be discovered and we can everyone can agree that something has gone wrong. But questions about whether there's something wrong with the apparatus, whether a certain scientist's uh, results are to be trusted often often are debated for years or even decades uh, and never fully resolved. So it's really not so simple to decide that a certain theory is facing an avalanche of contrary evidence. Um, I do think that theories are buried by evidence in the end, but it doesn't happen in the straightforward way Popper, uh, straightforward way that Popper makes out. Okay. But the, the main debate then you're saying really is now that, um, is that between those who don't believe there's any scientific method at all, therefore, that um, we live in, I suppose, a subjective world and science requires objectivity. And in fact, we have a, we have in a postmodern kind of approach to things, no, no, no truth at all behind the scenes and that the search for truth is therefore a bit of a vain quest. Is that the main debate here now? Well, that's one side of the main debate. On the other side, what you would have, although I wonder sometimes whether it's really the other side at all, what you will have is attempts to 
give a kind of a, a, a logic of, of what evidence is telling us about theories that takes into account these, these the morals of the Popper story that, that um, much of what goes into the assessment of evidence depends on scientists' opinions about the reliability of certain techniques, the reliability of certain experimenters. Uh, that that brings that in to the process of reasoning, but but when this comes into the process of reasoning, it's inevitably itself uh, a kind of subjective, and so if you like the the modern logicians of science, although they say there is a method, there is a logic, acknowledge at the same time something that that the anti-method people also want to say, which is that is that there is no set of rules that scientists can follow that are simply going to tell them how to think about the evidence, tell them what the evidence says about the theories and, and bring about a kind of agreement on which theories are promising and which are not in the light of the evidence. Mm. So there, is a, there are arguments still, but there is no longer really a great argument about the possibility of an objective logic of, of science. That has pretty much fallen by the wayside. Right. So um, subjectivism tends to rule then. Mm -hmm. if, if that's the case, then, um, how do we account for things like progress in science? If there isn't any truth to search after, according to, to some people, then how is it that we seem to get maybe closer to it? Because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a typical kind of joke that the people who are, who are writing against um, science and saying there's no method and science doesn't properly work and it's made up uh, often using their iPads or their laptops in order to write those very things which are <laughs> the um, the product of science no doubt yeah which they've been benefited from that's so true so something must be happening even if we can't find a consensus on what the evidence says in the short term if you look at particular if you look at five or ten years of debates you take a few steps back and look at the way science develops in the long term. And although it's not always, of course, uh, inevitably tending towards the truth, nevertheless, it seems to be rather good at using the evidence to, to figure out what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the answer to, to your question, uh, or at least the, the a sketch of an answer to your question, is that, is that uh, although in the short term it's relatively easy uh, for a scientist to be suspicious of certain kinds of results, certain kinds of measurements, some of their colleagues' abilities, perhaps, certain kinds of calculation techniques. In the longer term, things tend to build up in a way that favors one side rather than the other. So in the short term, you can say, well, maybe that time something went wrong. Maybe in that particular uh, uh, set of observations, um, things weren't calibrated quite right. But scientists go back what they do is rather than resolving these arguments about whether, whether that particular set of measurements was right, they go back and they just try again and again. And eventually, uh, as they work harder and harder and begin to understand the various difficulties that, that always plague scientific observation, measurement, and so on, they're able to produce results that tend to become more and more consistent, not always, but often become more and more consistent. And in the end, everyone or almost everyone kind of agrees that, that, uh, that the evidence points one way rather than another. So you have this long, slow process of convergence in which different scientists are persuaded by different pieces of evidence, but they all become persuaded one way or another. And so we get our iPads and our interplanetary travel. You, you tell the story quite well, I think, of um, Eddington, I think, in this respect, where he's seeking to um, demonstrate whether Einstein's theory of relativity is correct or whether it's wrong um, based upon his uh, measurements of um, stars and an eclipse in different parts of the world. But um, um, the story there is interesting because I think I, I didn't realize from the, the, the ambiguity that was built into that, that setup. Can you say something about, about um, Eddington's, um, shall we say, um, uh, desires to come up with the right answer. <laughs> sure. So Eddington was a big, uh, a, 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 a big fan of Einstein's theory of gravity, theory of relativity. Uh, and just in the, in the first few years after it was published, right in the middle of World War I, immediately after the war, uh, Eddington set out to test one of the predictions that Einstein's theory made about the bending of light. This, this 
uh, experiment had to be performed during a solar eclipse. So uh, you had to wait until an appropriate eclipse came along. But as it happened, there was one um, especially favorable one coming up just, just three years after uh, uh, Einstein had published his theory. And so Eddington set off actually a, a two-part expedition to different parts of the world to observe this eclipse. And in the end produced three separate sets of measurements, each supposed to measure the bending of light by gravity. Uh, and it turned out that these measurements pointed in different directions. One of them, one of them um, seemed to show that Einstein was right, although it was uh, a little bit off and it was, seemed to show that Einstein was more than just right. Uh, another one, though, seemed to show Einstein was wrong and, and the old Newtonian theory was right. And a third one with a lot of calculation maybe showed that Einstein was right. So great. Think, looking at how these measurements were performed, the difficulties they had, you know, the weather wasn't very good. Um, one set of photographs was rather blurry, photographs of the star field behind the eclipse sun and so on. You really get a sense for how difficult science can be. And the, different, the, the thing they were trying to measure was differences in the positions of the stars, apparent differences. that are on the order of just a fraction of a millimeter. So tiny, tiny little differences on their photographic plates. Anyway, Eddington thought in the end, um, now he was buoyed up by his hopes for Einstein's theory and actually his desires for a, a kind of a uh, one to build one kind of bridge between Anglo and German culture in the wake of the First World War. He thought that he could argue that, that the pro-Einstein results were simply better, cleaner results. But not everyone thought that. Uh, and we still don't really know why these different results, uh, why these results came out differently. We can guess uh, why one set looked to Newtonian, one set looked more Einsteinian. You know, we of course we know now Einstein seems to be uh, 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 is is thought to be right. But the reason is not because we ever figured out what happened with those Eddington experiments so much as that we've gone back. This harks back to what I was saying before, and and at further favorable eclipses in the in the intervening hundred years made these measurements over and over again. And, and it slowly the evidence is built up and, and pointed much more towards the Einsteinian prediction than the Newtonian prediction. So you get something a little bit like Popper's falsification in the sense that we can now say that we have a whole lot of evidence which, which points towards Einstein and away from Newton, but it didn't come in any one particular experiment. You know, Eddington really just had to, in the end, say, I think something went wrong with these with this experiment pointing to the, new, the results that looked more favorable to Newton, whereas these ones look really nice to me. And, you know, in some sense, he was right, but he had no real way of arguing, writing six months after these photographs were taken, <laughs> that he was right. Uh, it was just a kind of a hunch. <laughs> and yeah. it... So the, really, the, the simple story that we're all told about Eddington went out there and he, he performed the experiments and he confirmed that Einstein was right and everything was smooth and simple. It's actually not as simple as all of that at all. In fact, it's muddied and, and quite um, quite mixed up with some subjective feelings and um, and impressions that people might have had and the desire to come up with the right answer. And, and that must be, therefore, the idea that you have here in this first section about the great method debate. The method is not quite so clear cut or straightforward or it, it hasn't been so. And, and we just get simplified pictures. That's right. So they there, the, the conclusion of that section is that is, is what I say is a, really the kind of consensus among all of us working on science these days that there, there is no logic of uh, the interpretation of evidence that isn't completely run through with subjectivity. So even insofar as there is a kind of, uh, there is a kind of a systematization to the way that scientists think about the evidence. It's not the kind of systematization that's going to get them to agree on anything in the short term. Okay, well, that brings us to the second section that you've got in your book, which is how science works, presumably how science really does work. And um, and you, you present things like an, an, the iron rule and, and some other things. Can you tell us how you develop then your particular ideas that have come from this debate then? Well, I, I begin with an insight that I find in uh, Thomas Kuhn's writing about science, which is the idea that the, the, one of the things that makes modern science, I mean, science since the scientific revolution, so the last 300, 400 years, one of the things, most important differences between modern science and the science that preceded it is that there is this incredible emphasis 
on detail and precision in measurement and observation. So that can be uh, making very detailed observations of the positions of the stars, which is what Eddington was doing, or it can be making very uh, uh, detailed descriptions of some extremely complex process, like the way the genes express themselves in a developing embryo. But this kind of very complex, very difficult to obtain low level information is really what has enabled science to progress so much in the last few centuries. And the question we should be asking ourselves or the most fruitful question to ask ourselves in thinking about what makes modern science different and so effective is not uh, what is, is not, not a question about some special logic for thinking about the significance of this evidence, but rather uh, looking for some kind of motivational uh, framework that gets scientists to spend the agonizing uh, uh, amount of time they do literally years and years actually making these measurements. I mean, even in the case of Eddington, his, his two crews sailed off to different parts of the world. You know, they had to, in those days, it had to be a journey by ship. So they were uh, uh, many weeks at sea and then uh, setting up all of the apparatus and so on. The, the experiment itself took months and months and months of their time. And it was all hinged on a few moments of totality of the eclipse itself, which could easily, and in fact, and, Neither, in neither place was the weather perfect, could easily have, the whole experiment could easily have turned out to be a bust, as it turned out to be somewhat complicated and interesting, not a bust. But you, you need this real devotion to ferreting out the details. And one of the, one of the insights Kuhn had was that science provides a special kind of framework, a kind of a social and intellectual cocoon, if you like, that um, makes it safe uh, for scientists to do this work. And really the, the, a, a good part of the second part of my book is, is a, a kind of an updating of Kuhn's ideas about the way that that motivation is supplied to scientists. Wow. So tell us about, the thing you, you mentioned very strongly is, is something called the iron rule within this, this, this element of how science works. Can, can, can you elaborate on that and explain that to us? The iron rule, which I see uh, as, the, as the, the very heart of modern science, uh, says to scientists, resolve all of your disagreements uh, by uh, looking at the evidence, by empirical testing, by, by making observations and measurements, uh, and seeing how well your theories are able to predict or explain those observations or measurements. So that sounds a little bit like Popper, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Except that uh, uh, we know now that these in, the interpretations that scientists have of the evidence are going to differ. So the iron rule is not able to provide uh, a kind of a, a objective framework for interpreting the evidence. All it's able to do is to provide an objective framework for deciding what counts as evidence. So it says to scientists, if you wanna, if you like play this game, the science game, uh, if you wanna be a real scientist, what you have to do is generate evidence and then argue with other scientists uh, uh, using that evidence. Inevitably, uh, you'll have different interpretations of the evidence. Okay, that happens. So go out and generate more evidence. If the results from the uh, measurements of the, the, uh, the, the stars during the eclipse are controversial, then go and do it again. And then if people still disagree, do it again and again and again. Uh, at great expense and time and money, but just keep on going. Uh, so that's what the iron rule is saying. Uh, and, and by saying this, it's able to bring about the situation where scientists do throw themselves wholly into, into this generation of evidence, uh, into this, this activity of, of measurement, frequently extremely frustrating, uh, uh, frequently uh, kind of risky in the way that the Eddington teams could have simply had, had cloudy weather on the day of the eclipse and come back with nothing at all. Uh, yet because they're, they're compelled by the rule to do science uh, in this way, rather than by say, philosophizing or examining, comparing the, 
the, the beauty of different theories. You know, Eddington thought Einstein's theory was very beautiful, but he wasn't able to say, we should believe Einstein because the mathematics is so wonderful. He had to actually get on a boat uh, and sail to an island off the coast of Africa and, 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 uh, and set up these experiments. The iron rule says do that. And by saying that it's created this, it's been able to, to elicit this enormous hoard of evidence which in the end has been able over many iterations to uh, direct science, scientists' attention towards the theories that, that on the whole get things right most of the time. Okay, but um, how does the, the appeal to empiricism, the idea that you need to go out and measure it and check it, how does that deal with um, the multiplication of hypotheses? So for example, you know, when, when, when Ptolemy said, look, the, um, the Earth is the center of the, uh, the universe, and everything goes around it, you know, and the sun goes around it, and all the stars go around it, all the planets go around the Earth, everything goes around the Earth. And at a first approximation, that seems fine, because you look at the sky and it, it goes round. But then someone says, wait a minute, let me measure this more precisely. And then you see some things go, go backwards and, and forwards this way, and you have this retrograde motion in the sky because it doesn't really go around that way. And so the, the, the answer is not, let's scrap that idea. What people then do is, so, no, no, let's have another hypothesis. And we'll, we'll bring out the idea of epicycles. And then you have epicycles on the epicycles in order to account for all the motion. And you can account for it that way. And you can account for all the um, things as an explanation. But it doesn't help you to decide between the Copernican system or the uh, Ptolemaic system, or does it ultimately? Well, the acceptance of the Ptolemaic uh, of the Copernican system was was a while coming. So Copernicus published his ideas back in the early 1500s, but it's really only in the early 1600s that that the the um, the heliocentric, the sun-centered solar system, really finally um, gains hold. So some of those very precise measurements, which which showed us that the planets are all orbiting the sun and what's more in ellipses, not, not circles. Ellipses that in many cases are pretty close to circles were made by the great Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe uh, back now, this is in uh, a good 50 years after Copernicus. Even, even Tycho himself did not, uh, did not believe in the heliocentric system. He had the earth at the center of his system. Then he had the, the sun going around the earth and all the other planets going around the sun. That was how he, uh, uh, explained his, his measurements. But nevertheless, it was his extremely precise measurements that, that were ultimately system, systematized by Kepler in a way that, that, that gave us the elliptical orbits around the sun and that were eventually explained by Newton using his theory of gravitation. That whole process, though, is, is a good 150 years or so. Plus, of course, at the same time, the development of the physics that explains how the Earth can be traveling so fast around the sun without us all having to kind of, as it were, find something to hang on to so we're not uh, thrown off into outer space. The, the, what's really driving that process in the end is the precision of these measurements. The Copernican system is lovely, and a lot of thinkers who became early Copernicans were motivated by that loveliness, but that is... Is, is not in the same way that Eddington was motivated by the loveliness of Einstein's theory of relativity. So scientists uh, take these things into account privately, but if they are to do science, they have to make the measurements. And in the end, it's the measurements that carry the day. It's the measurements that drive science forward and establish consensus. But that's another distinction which you interestingly make in, in this section of the book, where you talk about the difference between private reasoning and public argument within the scientific community. Can you, can you say something about that and why that difference is important? Right, so the, the iron rule it's, is really a speech code. It doesn't actually tell scientists, it doesn't restrict scientists thinking in any way. Uh, it doesn't restrict their interpretation of the evidence in any way. Uh, and it also doesn't restrict their ability to bring in other considerations, such as the beauty of something like the Copernican system or Einstein's theory of gravity, uh, uh, or uh, concern for, say, theological orthodoxy, uh, which 
many scientists have have in the, the history of science considered to be extremely important. Uh, uh, it doesn't it doesn't prevent them from thinking philosophically, from looking for a certain kind of philosophical harmony or rightness in their ideas. They're able to basically throw anything at a problem they like as long as they keep it to themselves or 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 uh, as long as they just talk to other scientists or even these days it's it's fine for them to uh, talk about this stuff on television or in podcasts or in popular books but the one place they're not allowed to talk about any of that stuff is in official scientific publications so the development of modern science has been uh, has been accompanied by the development of a, a kind of a institutional structure for publishing scientific scientific um, findings. Um, in a way, something like Darwin's writing of the, the origin of the species is, is kind of somewhat that I mentioned earlier is a little unusual. Uh, uh, what's been most important for communicating scientific results have been scientific journals, starting with the Journal of the Royal Society uh, uh, in the UK um, back in the 17th century. And it's just in this one venue that the iron rule applies. So it's just in this one venue that you can, you may only argue for or against theories using uh, empirical arguments, arguments that say something like this, well, we got these measurements, but the theory predicted this, so this, it looks bad for the theory, or the, we got these measurements and the pre theory predicted those measurements, so it looks good for the theory. In those journals, that's the only kind of argument you're allowed to mount. You can do it using all sorts of sophisticated statistical apparatus and so on, but that's all in the end there's going to be. No matter how much personally you believe uh, that the elegance or beauty of your theory testifies in its favor, those any, any remarks along those lines uh, must be at, at best utterly marginal. So mm -hmm. what, the, what the rule is doing is it's setting up a kind of a, uh, it's, it's setting up a, a kind of a um, bottleneck uh, in science at its point of point of communication where scientists communicate with one another and, and officially argue with one another. And by saying that only that here only empirical evidence counts, it forces any scientist who actually wants to be a part of this, this whole institution of arguing uh, about which theories of the world are right and wrong to do it all in terms of evidence. That's the sense in which it is just a speech code uh, and, and nothing more, but it's enough uh, for it to be a speech code to motivate scientists to, uh, to, to do these kinds of extremely elaborate, expensive, arduous um, uh, observations that are what makes science what it is. And they're probably getting more and more arduous as time goes on, as you, you need to get even the, you know, the the seventh decimal place, the, the tenth decimal place, the fifteenth decimal place to make any improvements, which makes it all more difficult each time. But you've, you've got, if I understand it, then you've got um, a number of principles which are which are either ancillary to or backing up or part of the iron rule. You've got only empirical testing counts. You've got this distinction between public argument and, and private reasoning. You've got a demand for objectivity in, in whatever you're doing. And there's something else which you call a shallow explanation of, of causes. Could you could you say something about that? Or shallow causal explanation. Yeah, sorry, put it that way. I think that this is this is the idea uh, which again it's something that that is if now seems just like a a, um, a very standard part of scientific thinking, but was a kind of remarkable innovation and revolution in thinking in the back in the 17th century when the scientific revolution was underway. You can find this idea laid out very clearly in the little methodological appendix that Newton wrote to his great book, The Principia, where he lays out his theory of gravitation. Where uh, now Newton is operating uh, in a world in those hundred years, let's just say the, the 1600s, where uh, many thinkers who want to understand how the wor world works thinks that, thinks that a theory of the world is intelligible only if it uh, presents uh, a, kind of, uh, a kind of explanation of the way things work that goes down to the very metaphysical depths of, of reality. So the 
most common way this idea is expressed is in the idea that uh, all explanation must be by way of collision between particles, something that, say, uh, René Descartes thought was, 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 was crucial to, to doing physics right, but there were, he had a great deal of company. And the reason that, that was so important was that, that we needed our causes in science to be intelligible. Uh, and at least at the time, it was thought that two atoms bouncing off one another like billiard balls, that was a kind of a, a, kind of a um, process that gave you a, a, a kind of a, a bedrock intelligibility or understanding of what was going on. If you could explain everything in terms of collision, then you really understood the way the world worked. Now, Newton produced this book, uh, the most, perhaps the most important book in the history of science, in which he uh, presented a theory of gravity that did none of that, none of it. So his gravitational force was completely unexplained. Um, it was, it looked at first to be this mysterious action at a distance. Newton thought, maybe it's all ultimately explained by uh, particles bouncing off one another, but I don't have any kind of evidence for or against a story like that. I have no story to tell about the particles. And what Newton did, which was a remarkable thing, was he, in effect, changed the rules. He said, uh, and, and this really comes out in the appendix I mentioned, he said, uh, he said, to do science, you don't need to, you don't need to give causal stories in terms of ultimately intelligible processes. All you need to do is lay out some principles and they should be causal principles, uh, but, but they don't need to themselves be explained. They don't need to uh, make any kind of philosophical sense. Uh, it's enough that you lay out these principles and you can use this very phrase. It's simply enough to lay out these principles and show that they, they predict and therefore by, by, uh, they, they causally explain uh, the phenomena, they explain the tides, they explain the motion of cannonballs, they explain the motions of the planets orbiting the sun. He but said the, that's, that's enough and that counts as an explanation. Well, that was my question. Is it, is it enough? And, and the, the interesting thing which, which you've just brought to mind, to, to my mind, is the, is the equally interesting debate between Bohr and Einstein well, over the, the quantum theory, which um, when Bohr was saying in his Copenhagen interpretation, you don't really know what's going on below the scenes here, but that doesn't matter. You can work out what's actually going to happen. You can calculate and you can see what the results are. But Einstein wasn't very happy with that approach. And Einstein said that, um, you know, his famous comment about God does not play dice. It's not a random kind of world that we have here. There must be some causal explanation that's going on here and I'm not very happy said Einstein with the idea that you can just have this fuzzy world picture was was Einstein wrong in that then I, I, I don't know whether he was right or wrong I can easily right. sympathize with his thought that there's something about quantum mechanics that's very unsatisfying uh, and he might be right in thinking there's something unsatisfying there and there's much more to be said in the same way that uh, he, there was more to be said about Newton's gravitational force. And he, Einstein, <laughs> did in fact succeed in saying it, uh, as best we know. However, here's a way in which Einstein was wrong, not uh, intellectually, but methodologically. I think it's, it's crucial for the progress of science that we follow Newton's rules and that we not worry about intelligibility in public scientific argument. Now, it's fine for scientists like Einstein to, to ponder these questions behind the scenes, but the way that science has been able to move forward is to operate in Newton's way and simply to formulate principles that get the phenomena right, or that at least purport to get the phenomena right, and to call that um, a, a piece of scientific work a piece of publishable scientific work. So not to worry about satisfying these demands for intelligibility. Uh, and it's, if, we, if we do it that way, then again, we're able, to, we're able to leverage the power of this evidence-based way of thinking to, to move science forward uh, without getting caught up in the uh, what are essentially philosophical arguments about what really makes sense. 
Now, I'm a philosopher, so I love philosophical arguments. Uh, and furthermore, I have great respect for scientists like Einstein uh, or Eddington. And, and as we know, in fact, Newton himself in his own private thinking, since we've looked now at his unpublished work, I have great respect for scientists who think this way in private, who think philosophically in private. But at the same time, I see that the single greatest reason for science's success is that it's managed to banish that from, from the, uh, the, the public science game, if you like, to create a system where to get ahead in science, uh, none of that stuff counts. So use it, use it by all means and your own private thought to motivate your thought or simply to inspire you to go on. But then what's, going to, what's really going to drive science forward is the fact that in the end, uh, if you want to argue in favor of the theory you've, you've, you, you've found, who knows what way, you need to produce the evidence. You need to produce the numbers, the very precise numbers. And that's turned out to be what's ultimately uh, shown us the way, uh, uh, shown us the difference between the theories that are almost right uh, and the theories that really are right. Okay. Let's move on to the third section of your book, which is entitled, Why Science Took So Long. Can you tell us something about what's in that section, what, what, what that's about? This is, this is gonna take us back to the, the, the title, the subtitle, uh, The Unreasonable Idea. Uh, the thought that there's something about the way that modern science is done, which, which encountered naively for the first time, not knowing how successful science has been would strike any reasonable person as a little bit crazy. Okay, so, so these rules for public scientific argument are saying, yes, certainly uh, intelligibility may be important. Yes, certainly the beauty or elegance of a theory may be important, something that many contemporary physicists very, very um, strongly believe, but none of that should be allowed to count when you're arguing for your theory. So the rules of the science game are saying, on the one hand, yes, let's take beauty. Uh, yes, the beauty of a theory may count strongly in its favor uh, uh, as uh, uh, when we're trying to decide what we should believe. And yet at the same time, you must not uh, in any way take beauty into account in public argument. So here's something that's very important and revealing uh, and will would really help us get to the truth if we're allowed to consider it, but we're not allowed to consider it. Okay. So on the one hand, that seems, that seems um, a little bit obtuse, but on the other hand, by focusing scientists' efforts, their, their, their daily activities, 100% on the production of evidence, it's in fact been incredibly fruitful. So if you have two theories, which both meet the available evidence at the moment, and one is simpler and more beautiful than the other, wouldn't that count in its favor as opposed to the more complicated one? Isn't that a test of which theory you'd prefer to go with? That, that may be something that many scientists take into account in their private thinking, but what, what you won't find in a scientific journal is simply an evaluation of two theories uh, uh, according to some simplicity metric. So there's a lot of a lot of statistical calculation. Uh, a lot of statistical methods will 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 give you spit out numbers, telling you uh, that that are supposed to help you think about uh, uh, what a theory says about the evidence, how how well it matches the uh, the evidence matches the theory. But what you won't find is a number that's supposed to tell you how simply the theory explains the evidence. And that's because these arguments are ruled out of court. Again, I'll say, it's not as if scientists don't think about these things. It's not as if they don't take them into account when they decide what they should, what, what theories they should pursue or not pursue or what tests to conduct. But, but if they're gonna make progress, it can never be in some, uh, a, a matter of simple versus less simple. There always has to be some piece of evidence that fits poorly with one of these theories and well with the other. In the end, the simple theory has to not only be simple, it has to be uh, empirically more successful. Yes, but I think this, this might take us back to um, 
uh, the Copernican um, idea or the Copernican revolution here, because you know the uh, the idea of the, the Earth at the center, with all this, all the planets going round, and then you make your measurements, and as you make your measurements finer and finer, you realize it's not actually fitting very well. Um, the, the the Ptolemaic model just doesn't fit, and so you have to alter the model, and you make it more complex. As I, I mentioned, these epicycles, you have the epicycles, and then the epicycles on the epicycles, and it becomes a very very complicated model that way but it still explains the evidence and you can multiply your hypotheses explaining things but they become so complicated it's become unwieldy and then suddenly someone comes along with a, a revolutionary idea like Copernicus says well wait a minute if you just transpose everything to a heliocentric system suddenly everything becomes simpler and more beautiful and that produces the revolution that Thomas Kuhn is, uh, is, uh, was, was on about. In fact, I, I was interested to hear that the word, the word revolution in the term of being revolutionary, you know, a, a massive change actually started with Copernicus because it was, because it revolved around the sun is where the word revolution comes from. It's interesting. But, but doesn't that mean though that, um, that the beautiful system, the easier system, the simpler system, is the one that people will jump to is that in this kind of paradigm shift because it makes things simpler and easier to understand and fits the data. It has to fit the data. It has to fit the data. And Copernicus, Copernicus's system didn't quite fit the data. Uh, oh. It was really only with, with Kepler's refinements and the light, light of Tycho's measurements that that there was a heliocentric system, one where all the planets go around the sun, that was empirically more successful than Ptolemy's system, as well as being, uh, being simpler and offering a more elegant explanation of such things as, um, as retrograde motion, which you mentioned earlier with the, the yeah. inner planets, what we now think of as the inner planets, um, start moving backwards for time. So, and that, so it was really only, of course, this is the very beginning of the development of the of the kind of institution I'm talking about when I talk about modern science. But even, even then it took, it was only once the, the Copernican style system became uh, clearly more empirically successful that uh, it became fully accepted. Right. So that by the time Newton was writing, it really wasn't an issue anymore uh, uh, what the structure of the solar system was. Yeah. This brings us to the, the final section, which is, science now and um i wonder how you see science now and whether we're progressing in a way in which you would hope we would progress and how do you ensure that um you know the science of today will will, will still be as powerful and useful as the science of the past i mean i think one of my main concerns in this in this final part is to is is to protect science from, from those people who write, look at it and rightly think, this is very strange, the way we're doing things here. You know, we were, uh, it took a long time even to develop the idea of modern science because it looks unreasonable, irrational in its narrowness and its focus exclusively on, on empirical evidence. And every generation of scientists or science policy types or politicians can, can make that observation all over again and say, why are we being so narrow here? One place, one place where this issue has come up, one area is in uh, string theory and fundamental physics, a theory that is uh, practically impossible for us right now to test. And, and uh, many people think will be impossible to test anytime soon in the future or maybe ever in the future. So in other words, a theory that might be right, uh, whose beauty many theorists think testifies strongly in its favor, favor, but which can only be established according to the current rules if we find evidence in its favor. It turns out though, it's too expensive and complicated to do the experiments required. I mean, in the sense of being way, way beyond our practical ability. So what do we do? Well, some Physicists have thought, why don't we allow beauty and simplicity into our, into our, uh, uh, our arenas of debate and so on? We should, it should be okay to argue for a theory in, in virtue of its elegance after all. Um, if it were restricted to string theory, maybe that would be okay. But I wanna, I wanna point out, that's one of the 
the missions of this section, I want to point out that there's a good reason that uh, science is so weirdly narrow. And so we shouldn't suspend the rules without thinking very hard about the, the, the uh, uh, important function of those rules. Okay. We what, what are the other missions of this section as well? You have other things that you want to say to present day scientists, I think, don't you? And, and maybe future scientists. Yes, I want to, I, I think I want to, I want to, and now this isn't something I say explicitly, but I want to, uh, scientists to understand, if you like, some of the uh, discord, discord they feel in their own hearts, perhaps. So suppose, I mean, I think some scientists simply take on the iron rule, the idea that everything must be done in terms of empirical evidence, and they push ahead with it. They don't question it. They get their job done. At the end of the day, they're happy. But it's it puts other scientists in a, in a sort of a odd position of, on the one hand, caring so much about such things as, as theoretical beauty, and on the other hand, finding that the rules of science uh, won't allow them to express themselves in public. And I wanted in this section to diagnose a little bit that, 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 um, that feeling of, um, of uh, conflict. And I suppose make science, by, by explaining the, the function of the, the strange narrowness, to, to make science seem ultimately a, 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 a pursuit that although unreasonable in its narrowness on a small scale is, is extremely reasonable and sensible when you take a few steps back and look at how it all fits together and ultimately works. Right. So how do, you, how do you build a scientific mind or a scientific outlook and how do you foster that amongst i mean you you must have students at your university what do you tell them is the the key and important central point that they must take on board then in order to do science well and do it properly well i think a lot of scientists get educated and this is something i say more explicitly in that final section get educated in effect by being turned into kind of, uh, if you like, avatars of the iron rule. Uh, so they're deliberately, we deliberately create uh, thinkers who, who only think in terms of empirical evidence. One way this is done, uh, which I, I comment on, um, Riley, I hope, is, uh, is in the disparaging comments that, that so many prominent scientists make about philosophy uh, in, in public. And you might take that as just a, a kind of a, um, you know, the the big, the big, the big boys in the schoolyard making fun of the the puny boys. That would be us, the philosophers, the the the, the puny ones. But I think what's really going on there is a certain kind of uh, ethic is being reinforced, an ethic that reminds scientists uh, that it's evidence above all that makes science the success that it is not philosophical thinking, and that turns their minds to producing that evidence. Um, these, these scientists are, in a way, are, 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 are intellectually impoverished by this process that makes them such good scientists. By, uh, and I feel, I, I myself, I don't know what to think about that. On the one, on the one hand, I'm, I see the virtues of a system that creates such um, efficient workers. Do, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be one, and I guess I didn't become one myself. I was going to say, do you think that all scientists should, should become philosophers to some extent, and philosophers become scientists to some extent, or should the two be completely separate? And what, and what do you see is the, is the essential difference then between science and philosophy? Is it the iron rule applied in one and not the other? I don't know. It is. So science, is, science has this focus uh, on empirical evidence. Philosophers take empirical evidence into account when it's relevant, but can take just about anything else into account as well. And I would say this about the, the humanistic disciplines generally, actually. Um, should, should scientists be philosophers? I think it can be valuable to some scientists. Um, to or would it compromise the their adherence to the iron rule? 
I, I worry a little bit about that, yes. I mean, not every, there are some people who, for whom a, there are some, a lot, a lot of people work best when the job that they need to do is very clearly laid out in front of them. And there's, there aren't too many things calling them off into other parts of the, the many spheres of thought. And I suppose for those, for those kinds of people, maybe it's better uh, that the science education system keeps them narrow, makes it simple, keeps it straightforward. Uh, other, other scientists don't want to be like that at all. And, and well, the scientists are, are great fun to talk to. <laughs> You, you, and you mentioned science you, as well. You mentioned in your book um, the the famous lecture by C. P. Snow in 1959, how he lamented the fact that there was a big gulf between the science and the arts, or the science and the humanities. And I wonder, is is that then a good thing? Well, one thing one thing that's very good is that there is a gulf between what's considered a a effective argument in science and what's considered an effective argument in um, humanistic pursuits. So in other words, it's important for science that, that uh, the public discourse of science, the publications of scientists are, in a, in a, you might say, anti-humanistic. I mean, you only need to look into a scientific journal to see, to see this at work. Uh, you mentioned earlier the the objectivity in science, and the objectivity is most, is most palpable in the way that scientific results are presented. In fact, scientists often seem to go out of their way to, to write in a, an engaging way. To, they're displaying how, how completely disconnected they are. They're not really, of course, but <laughs> they're performing, if you like, a kind of a, a disconnection from, from, the, from their findings. And that, I think, is, is extremely important. I haven't. I haven't disappeared. <laughs> I have. I have one last question for, for you, Michael, if I may, and that is um, looking to to the future now with science. And what would you say is the the biggest threat to science and its progress? Um, and do you see any threats for science? I know we live in a, as I am, a postmodernist world where maybe the search for truth is is not seen in the same kind of light. Is that a threat or are there even bigger threats than that to science? Well, I have to say I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. I think that, that enough people care about really figuring out how the world works and the scientific way of doing things has enough momentum and enough of a track record of success that we will continue to fund uh, uh, scientists working on the biggest and most interesting questions. Uh, and, um, and so I'm not, I'm not too worried. I mean, there are, there are certainly countervailing forces. There, are the, there is the force of the demand for practical applications. Uh, uh, it seems like every year, some politician somewhere is trying to cut funding for, for what people often call blue sky research or basic research. Um, there is the, there, of course, there are threats to applied science that come from, I guess right now, the, the anti-vaccine movement is a very, <laughs> very uh, visceral example of that. And in the longer term, the various forces that are arrayed against taking climate change too seriously, some of them are commercial, some of them are political. These are all real, these are all real um, oppositional forces in the world. And I, I fret about them, but I, I do have a, a kind of a, a feeling that's more one of hope than despair uh, when it comes to, to science's ability to keep on figuring out the answers to the questions that matter most. Michael Stebbins, thank you very much for your time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And, and Michael Stebbins' book here, um, the, the Knowledge Machine, is available in all good bookshops as I speak, certainly in this country, in the UK, and I'm sure in many other countries too. Um, and you can find it for um, £25 from um, Alan Lane. Michael, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thanks so much, Philip. That was really fun.